Welcome to Creatively Christian, a podcast by Theophany Media, where we inspire, inform, educate, and empower creative Christians of all types. I'm one of your hosts, Brandon Hollingsworth. Today, Andrea connects with A&R representative for Centricity Music, John Mays, to talk about the Christian music industry and the importance of stewarding our creative gifts. All right, everyone, welcome again to another podcast episode from Creatively Christian. I'm your host, Andrea Sandifer, and today I am so thrilled to be joined by John Mays. And John, I just like to toss it right back to my guests. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are, where you live, a little bit about your family, and maybe some of your creative work highlights. Okay. Well, uh, my name is John Mays. I live here in Franklin, Tennessee with my wife of 43 years. We have uh, 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 grown children now in their 30s who one of them has given us two grandchildren, a five and a two-year-old that takes, uh, that eclipses our life and we love it that way. Uh, Grandchildren are the reward for the toils of of raising children. I've I've figured that out. I've heard that Uh, often. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, we, we love spending time with them and, and they're so grateful that they live here in town. Uh, I grew up in a little town out in West Texas. Uh, the little church I grew up in uh, began affirming some musical gifting in me when I was a kid, literally uh, 10, 12 years old. It was a tiny church, but I was the music kid at my church and uh, I didn't go to college. As soon as I graduated high school, I kept chasing that thing which basically meant playing in different bands that I could find uh, out of high school. One of those bands uh, opened for a band out of Nashville. It was kind of a big deal for us. And that band uh, was, uh, uh, their bass player was leaving and I was, I was a bass player. And so they asked if I would like to come on a certain date to audition for them. And uh, I had spent two years with this particular band in East Texas and it had been probably the, the, the if I've ever been tested about do I really love doing this it was during those two years and I had about reached the end of that season and thought well this will be a neat way to end this chapter and I can say I had this professional audition and I went to Nashville and when we opened for them they had a girl singing for them that was the most beautiful girl I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought, if I go to the audition, I might see that girl again, which I did not. But I got the job, which moved me to Nashville, and that was in 1977. And I married that girl one year later. <laughs> oh, so, I love that. You can imagine my life changed in so many ways. It was the first time I was actually uh, in any sort of practical way paid to be a, a musician. And it was a great experience. These were some of the best people. And, and one of the, the guy who was the band director in that band, uh, really, I would credit him. He's passed away now, but I would credit him with teaching me how to be a musician and to think like a musician and to dig into different kinds of music and pay attention to them, uh, le- learn how to break them down and, and apply them. So, so grateful for that season. Uh, I, that led to a season of being uh, just a, a session player here in Nashville. There are road players that, you know, people who do play in touring bands. And then there are guys who just play on records. And I, was, I managed to mer- work my way into that kind of work, which also led them to some songwriting and independent production. Uh, and some of that work made its way to uh, the ear of a a friend, still a friend, these, uh, after all these years, a guy named Neil Joseph, who was a producer in town back in that day, uh, and got hired by Word Records to uh, uh, run their labels here in Nashville. And I knew him, he had heard some of this indie production and songwriting I had done, and he took me to breakfast one morning and uh, said, hey, I'm going to need to hire an A&R person, and I think you'd be good at it. And this was, of course, was before Google, so I, I didn't want to be uncool and say, what is that? And I couldn't, like, figure it out sitting there. I had to actually go ask somebody, but uh, 
uh, I did. I had heard the term, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, but it is. It does speak to the power of someone who sees something in you that you don't even see in yourself, right? Neil was really good at that, I think, and uh, it, I, I learned more about what the job is, and we can talk about that either here or later in the conversation. Uh, and I would say that the first year of doing it, you know, I had only been a musician. Now I'm I'm almost in my probably late 30s by this time and I had done nothing in my entire life literally except play music uh, or, or later on uh, write and produce music so this was a huge shift where there's an office and I have a salary and a, uh, there's office culture and memos and protocols and water cooler talk and all these things that I've never been a part of you know so I, I wondered about Neil's assessment assessment of me I think you'd be good at this a lot that first year I did I don't think I thought that I was good for it but uh, eventually I signed my first artist and things puzzle pieces started to come together and that was in 1987 that I started there I was at word for eight years I then moved over to uh, Sparrow Records which is in the Universal System I was there three years onto another label called Benson for two years. And uh, after that period, uh, I was introduced to a family up in Seattle who had approached me about starting a label, which had kind of always been a dream of mine uh, and, and not something I ever thought I would be able to do because of how much it cost and uh, just the risk of it, especially at that time, it was a very volatile time in the, in the industry on a business level. And uh, this family was just so precious and supportive. And that was the beginning of Centricity where I work now. Uh, that was probably in 02 or 03 that we began to have those conversations. 06 was our first actual release of any music. And uh, I'm still here. Uh, we're going on 15 years, which is unbelievable. So I've kind of had two jobs in my life, one playing music and then one being an a &R person. Uh, and I, I don't know if this is a good segue into what that means, uh, but it, would this be a good time to talk about that? Yeah, that I, I love the idea of you sitting there with him and going, okay, yeah, that sounds awesome. And not really knowing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's just one but, of those fly on the wall moments that would have been, yeah. So yeah, yeah tell, tell those that don't know and understand what yeah. it is that you do. Yeah, because it's an interesting, uh, A&R stands for artist and repertoire, and it's an old term that goes back to the 50s in music biz industry circles. Uh, there was a guy named John Hammond, who actually has a book, if anyone's interested, called The Operator. Uh, and John Hammond is kind of credited as the first real A&R person in the modern music era. Uh, John Hammond was a producer himself and, and did some writing, but... Uh, sort of saw a need in commercial music when in the 50s, 40s and 50s, a lot of what labels were recording and releasing were show tunes, classical music, but not a lot of reflection of the pop music that was being played in the clubs and bars, you know, that people were gravitating toward. So John Hammond finds like Billie Holiday in a club and people like this and uh, actually signed Bob Dylan, some people that uh, he then would like identify and then take them to a record label and say, you should be releasing music on this person. They're singing songs that people love, but you're not releasing music like this. So he kind of started uh, what is now my job. So there are kind of four functions in the role. Uh, one is this talent scout uh, function, which is you're responsible for finding the talent that your label will sign to record and release music on. Uh, second is sort of the, uh, the song category. So that's the R part, the repertoire, right? Going back to John Hammond, John would sit through a, a set of Billie Holiday music and say, well, out of those 18 songs you just performed, I think these are the 10 you should record. Or I think these, if we worked on this or that, you know, so there's a lot of probably we, this is where we spend our most time, which is getting songs, identifying which ones we're gonna record or getting them to a recordable place. So you're working with the artist who's almost always the writer as well. 
and uh, helping to identify which next set of songs we're going to record. That used to be a record, right? What we called a CD or a record with 12 or 13 songs on it. Now it could be a, a song, three songs, an EP. Uh, you know, everybody's kind of always writing and recording now and releasing stuff all the time. So that changed a lot of the rhythm of what I did for so many years. But it's also, there's a fun element to that now. So that's uh, the second part. The third is overseeing the production of the records. So uh, I, I align, try to align the vision and direction uh, with the artist and hire producers that would match that or a producer and where this, what the songs are, the stories they're telling, the messages that uh, are important for this artist to say in this next season, trying to align people around that to accomplish that in a, a recording. And, uh, you know, there's the creative sort of vision side and that piece of it. And then there's also the I'm responsible for the budget and the timeline, turning it in on time and all those kinds of things. The technical side of it, uh, where you're, approving mixes and mastering and th those sorts of things. So it's that's sort of wide ranging, but summed up in just uh, you're the you're responsible for the overseeing of the production of the music. And then fourth would be probably the least tangible, but with most of these artists that get signed, you're the first relationship they have at the label because it starts with you. So it's not the most important by any means. It's important to have a good relationship with everyone on the label team, you know. But uh, since it starts with you, it sort of ends up being yours to manage. And you find that you are in the role of champion, championing that artist to the rest of the team. And sometimes that's no problem when like everything's great and hits are flowing and that kind of thing. But when, when times are more bleak than that or when... Uh, uh, we haven't had a hit in three or four years. Sometimes you're reminding the team of your original belief in this artist, you know, or why it's important to keep going. Uh, uh, and of, obviously when it's in time to part ways, which that happens with every artist relationship, you're also sort of the, you're the driver of how that's going to happen and the the meeting where that will happen. And it's uh, the worst part of the job, obviously. But sure. uh, uh, so those are sort of the four functions, uh, talent scout, song person, uh, production overseer, and I'll, I'll call it relationship manager. Uh, and every label, I think, might have a little definition of what A&R is, but everybody at every label is doing one of those four things on any given day at their, in their A&R position. Very cool. Yeah, that's very wide ranging. Uh, man, uh, that's just a really important thing for artists and songwriters. So thank you for the work that you do. And, and um, not to name drop, but Centricity does foster relationships with some artists that are pretty darn incredible. Who, who do you enjoy working with right now? Who, who do you, who did you spend time with this week? Andrea, you can't do that to me. You like there's, there's probably not a much of a, a week that goes by that you're not in some sort of contact with everybody, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, now, I am one of three A&R people. I oversee our A&R department. Oh, so cool. there are two people that work with me and we divide the roster, you know, up. I, I think we're at 17 artists now total. Nice. So it's uh, it's probably hard for any A&R person to manage more than five or six artists, Uh and when I say manage, I don't mean like a manager, but just manage the A&R process with, right. with uh, more than five or six artists. Because at any given time, you've got multiple recordings going on with multiple artists. And that's just a lot to keep your hands around, you know, and your, your head around. So I don't think uh, if, if you would have asked that question even three years ago, I would say, well, right now I'm working on a record with so-and-so or so-and-so. But Truthfully, I'm working with uh, every artist at some stage of recording right now. Uh, you know, I've got uh, Jason Gray, who's only working on a single, and we're trying to find that one song that he needs to single this fall. Uh, I have Unspoken, who's working on a, a live record. Uh, I have Lauren Daigle, who's just now starting to write again, and we're setting up co-writes for her. 
So Glorious. everybody's in some different stage or rhythm, but there's not much of a week that goes by that you're not in some sort of communication with the, all the people that you're charged with their A and R work. That's incredible. And I, oh, I love to hear that Lauren's writing again. That makes my heart yeah. happy. Yeah, yeah. That's exciting. Um, yeah. Do you still like creating? Do you like, do you still pick up your bass and play? <laughs> you know, I did until a couple of years ago and that, that was mostly the worship team at my church, you know, and I did love doing that. I will turn 65 this year. My hair started graying a good five years ago and I saw a picture someone showed me uh, or posted somewhere or something of the worship team up on our, at our church. And it was like, huh, which one of those guys is not like the others? You know, I was so clearly generations ahead of everybody else on the stage. And it seemed like maybe this is the, a dignified time to step down and, and let younger people come in. So I, I uh, other than just sitting here at the house, sometimes, you know, I'll get it out and play. I play piano and, and often noodle around on piano and find a song idea in there somewhere, you know, that uh, I'll talk with an artist about. But I would say most of my creative work, well, there's, there's the creativity of any project we're working on. And there's, there's a lot of call for imagination and direction and creativity of where we're going with this thing, you know, and that even includes you get down the road and realize we well, well we took a wrong turn <laughs> you know we're we're going to have to recreate what we've already created the first time and, and head another direction but uh, i would say i i co-write songs a whole lot uh when an artist comes in and we're listening to songs and then maybe they're bringing in 30 songs you know and we've got to pick five out of these 30 hopefully we could get that i'm i'm making those numbers up. Sometimes it's a much greater ratio, sometimes less. But uh, so much of my work is like, should the bridge say this? Or, uh, you know, I don't feel like, I feel like the second verse is saying the same thing that the second, the first one does. And in any other room, that would be a co-writer, right? Uh, what, what if you change this line to this or whatever? But I learned early on that, uh, you know, you, it's, it's, it's going to break down a lot of trust if you're an artist and a writer and I'm your A&R person and I'm coming in and messing with your song and taking a percentage for it. Uh, that That's going to feel at least yucky and, uh, and uh, maybe even disingenuous or like my motive is not just for the best recording or song. It's actually so I can put money in my pocket. So I, I never have, never will. No one that ever works with us ever will take a percentage of a song that they have a hand in because that's just part of our job. You know, we get paid to do this job and that's part of it. So there is a lot of creative, creative expression that gets worked out in all that. Uh, I don't know how many songs in my career that's really long now that I would have said I co I've co-written, uh, but a bunch. Uh, and I don't have any qualms about that. I don't have any regrets about that at all. If the song is better, I'm all for it. And most of our artist relationships are to the point that if you suggest something and the artist is like, Ew, you know, I don't think so, that, that we're so cool about that. And open. I mean, there is obviously, you know this, there's no right or wrong. Uh, it's all so subjective and what makes something good or better is really subjective. So, uh, but that's probably, those are probably the areas that my creative expression gets worked out these days. That's awesome. And I think that's a, it's a beautiful example of being a champion for these songwriters, mm -hmm. these artists is being able to come alongside them as a, like a coach, a co-writing coach. And mm -hmm. um, man, I have learned the the benefit of co-writing just recently, just put the finishing touches on uh, just a little demo for um, something we're doing with Nashville Christian songwriters this weekend. Um, yeah. Our challenge was to find a co-writer this past month and create something and then That's gather so it up and share it. And it was so fun and it was yeah. so powerful to see, uh, the two minds coming together, you know, different, different, and she's actually, ironically, she's in Florida. So we're even in different, completely different Incredible. corners of the nation. <laughs> so. I, I will say, Andrea, there are a few writers that I've met over the years that just 
they don't like co-writing or they're just not good at it. But most people, and it's a weird thing, like you think about all the, all the other creative disciplines and no one co-paints or co-sculpts, you know, but uh, co-writing, songwriting is such a, uh, almost every time the two or three people will leave that room going, that's a better song than I would have written on my own. And that's powerful. So uh, for all anyone listening, I would encourage them to try it if they haven't. Uh, and, and even just the idea of opening your heart and mind up to another way of saying something. Uh, even if you don't record the song or use the song for anything, your crafting at least will get better just from that experience. Absolutely. Oh, I 100% agree. Everybody should yeah. try it at least once. That's awesome. Yeah. And if it's not a good experience, try it again, because I've, <laughs> there you go. I've had that happen too. So, oh yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you will be the better writer in the room and sometimes the other person will be, and that's fantastic. That's the yeah. way it ought to be. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Well, the, the first time we got to connect was this past October in Nashville when I went down for a conference and I walked yeah. away from that thinking, okay, John is pretty fantastic at encouraging <laughs> other songwriters. So in our shows, we love to spend some time kind of um, educating people and, but mostly want to encourage and empower um, creatives. So uh, I'd love to spend the rest of our time there. And yeah. you know, I kind of sent these questions to you ahead of time, but let's just dig into them. Cause I think these are really, these are good things that a lot of people would have a lot of questions um, similar to this maybe, but so what would you say to someone that struggles to balance art, faith, and business? <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, this is funny. And I don't remember if we talked about this the night we met, Andrea, but uh, uh, I think when I saw that question, the first thing that kind of came to my mind was give yourself a break. That's the first thing I would say to them. Give yourself some grace. Uh, these are three areas, art, faith, and and business that, that don't naturally go together. Not, none of them need the other to exist, right? You can make beautiful art without worrying about making a living at it or at glorifying God. You can certainly glorify God without art or business. All those things, they don't need each other, but there is a unique and I think special calling for people who are trying to hold those things together. And I used to actually do an entire talk on this. And when I did it, I had a slide deck. And I had these three circles, right? Art, business, and faith. And along the way of the talk, these three circles would come together and overlap, you know, in this place in the middle. And I made that overlap gold. Like, I think I put a smiley face on it. <laughs> the, and the, what I was trying to get at was like, this is the place you want to live where these three things intersect and overlap for you. Well, I wish I could go back to every one of those people who ever heard that talk and just apologize because that's probably a giant crock. I just, I think over the years I've realized those, they just don't go together and it's just going to be messy to try to hold them together. You're invited into that messiness, but it is, I think I looked at it as a problem to solve. And it's not. It's not a solvable problem. These things will always push against each other. But uh, it is a tension that you are invited to manage. And not everybody can handle that, right? Uh, and I don't know if anybody that's listening would be like thinking, oh, this makes sense. But to make it sort of practical, uh, I think in any given day as a, as a songwriter, a, a believing songwriter, you could finish a song that is making your heart beat fast. It's so beautiful, right? Or maybe you got a, an email from some person you didn't even know that said, I want, I want to tell you I heard your song and I had to get in touch with you because it changed my way of thinking. It changed my life. I don't view this situation the same as I did before I heard your song. Well, that's fruit. That's God glorifying, right? Then you realize my rent is due in two weeks and I could really use some income from my music making. None of that, it, there's no shame in any of that, right? Uh, the, if you feel invited to do music as a career, as a Christian, 
you're going to wrestle with all three, holding all three of these things together. It's unique to what we do. I think if you take the art piece out of it, the music piece out of it, like every church in the world is trying to combine ministry and, and business, right? Most businesses who, are, who have a spiritual mission, a Christian mission, have to do good business. And I've been an elder at a church for years. It's a mess there. Uh, it feels icky to combine ministry and business. And then you, the art piece on top of it, give yourself some grace and realize that you'll never figure it out, but just dive in and don't feel shame when you're focused on one piece of those three because you'll get to the others eventually, maybe in that same day. I love that. Yeah. 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 I think that's, it's a constant, um, constant battle in my world. And it's, that's really assuring yeah. that it, they're not really meant to coexist necessarily in that. No. Don't need to. Yeah. I, yeah, exactly. One doesn't need the other. I think that's a good reminder. So yeah. awesome. Okay. Uh, something that stuck with me since October when you said this was about personal integrity and work ethic. So why is personal integrity and work ethic in our lives and our creative pursuits so important? Yeah. Well, they, they're in a way, these are two different topics. They do, they do go together, but you can certainly have one without the other. You know, you can you can have high work ethic and be a heathen <laughs> and you can be a very trusted high integrity person and have low work ethic. But uh, I do think to be, for the most part, to be successful in these, this endeavor that we're in, uh, it does require both. And probably on the work ethic side, it would be almost universal I mean, you can find this anywhere. One of my favorite quotes is a, a Will Rogers quote that uh, that most people miss opportunity when it shows up because it's usually wearing overalls. <laughs> In other words, uh, you you got to go to work, right? And any any a successfully creative person that I've ever read, forget music, authors, painters, poets, will tell you until I learned to show up every day and go to work, like the whole uh, creativity is about, you know, uh, it's 80% perspiration and 20% inspiration, that whole thing. That's just, a, that's just a truth about making anything creative. The people who, who get the work out, right, who uh, they, they, you don't look at their year and see that they've written two songs this year, right? They've written 60 songs this year because they committed themselves to doing the work and the work is not always inspirational, uh, but it does lead to inspiration often, not always, but often. So uh, there's so much, there's so many books out there on this and, and great quotes, but uh, one that inspired me a lot was uh, Stephen King's book called On Writing, uh, which is about the first half is about his story, which is incredible. You know, he was hit by a, he was out for a walk and got hit by a van and it's a miracle that he, he lived, but how that affected his commitment to his work. And then Stephen King has been writing at the same desk, 3,500 words a day minimum for going on 30 years. This is his commitment to the discipline. And he, he will tell you in this book, there's no way I would have, and, and the, the reward and uh, uh, you know, accomplishment of Stephen King, whether you like his work or not, that's you know, a different category, but I don't think there's another living writer that's had more books that have been uh, turned into screenplays, the awards he's been, uh, the guy gets out to work and he is good and he's celebrated for it. Now, you need some natural gifting. If you don't have natural gifting, it doesn't matter how much work you put in, right? But it's sort of like God's job is to give you the gift, then your job is to steward it. And the stewarding of it is the showing up and going to work, putting on the overalls. So that's the work ethic part. The personal integrity part for me is a lot more about building trust with your audience, with your co-writers, with the people who support you. 
And Andrea, it's, uh, you know, it's funny, integrity. I, I saw a guy talk one time. He was talking about integrity and character, and he had two hula hoops. Uh, and he's holding them apart, and he says, this hula hoop is who people think you are, and this hula hoop is who you actually are. And he starts to bring them together, you know, and they begin to overlap. And he's like, this here is integrity, where these people, where this is overlapping. And he brought the two together where it looked like one, um, one hula hoop or one giant circle. And he said, this is very rare for someone, for a human being to get to the place where absolutely who people think they are is absolutely who they are, right? When, uh, when they're in private. But the, the job is to cooperate with the Holy Spirit's work in you to grow those things closer and closer together as you grow in your faith and in just in your age. Uh, so if you, uh, it's, it's so funny. And from my perspective in Christian music, it's a pretty small community. You know, there are probably, even including the artists, there may be 300 people that do 90% of the commercial Christian music that's out in the world. And a lot of us, we all know each other, right? But uh, I've now had the privilege of being around it for so long. Somebody shows up and there's a problem with their integrity or their character. It's known really quickly and they're gone pretty soon. Mm. Uh, and even the ones that hang out for a while, you're just watching it going, there's something fishy there and God's probably going to take care of that. <laughs> and almost always... It does happen. I, th I think it's true in larger communities too, but it might not just rise to the surface as quickly, you know, as it does in ours. Uh, but we're talking about kingdom stuff here, right? Where you are a person who does what you say you will do. You're a person who, and I'm, yeah, I, I talk to the guys who work with me all the time. Like if you say you're going to be there at two o'clock, be there at two o'clock. Honor the other person's time. Yes, we work in the music business. They're probably going to be late, but you were there when you said you were going to be there. Uh, you're supposed to call a person at a certain time, call them at that time. So little bitty things like that, all of them, of course, reflecting a life of faith that is honest. When you, when you are writing songs that uh, are bringing the hula hoops closer together, right? This is who I really am. And I'm trying to express this lyric the best I can to tell you, my audience, this is my struggle. This is the, uh, this is where I break down. This is where I don't know if I believe what I say I believe anymore. It's so weird how most Christian artists never want to talk about those things publicly, of course, but it's the stuff that connects with everybody else so universally, right? It's the most powerful kind of lyric, if you think about it, uh, almost always when you hear an artist or a songwriter be vulnerable about where they are, are in their own life in a way that reflects their own character and integrity, it, it there's always, always this resonance of, oh, me too. I, I would never have the courage to say that, but me too. Well, that's such a powerful connection with an audience that you don't, want to live that kind of life of personal integrity so you can mani manipulate your audience, right? But I do think you will be surprised as you try to practice it in your songwriting and in communication, how it brings people into the truth of what you're writing. There's probably no more powerful response from an audience member than me too. If you connect on that level, and if you say, uh, Lord, I wanna be yours, okay. Uh, that's not an original statement. It's true, but it's not original, right? Uh, you might not get a real Me Too connection, but Madeline Lingle in her book, uh, Walking on Water, said one time, uh, she defined art in that book as that art is that which makes the truth new all over again. <sighs> art is that which makes the truth new all over again. Well, that's a pretty high bar right, to, to carry into a writer's room, especially when you're open to write something that Caleb will play. <laughs> but uh, it's an awesome standard for uh, how can I use my own integrity, my own experience in an honest way to 
put a twist on this thing that's been said a thousand times. There is no new truth. There's nothing to write about that exposes new truth, but can I reframe it in a way from my own personal experience that maybe is a little bit risky? I don't know if people are ready to hear this from me, but I'm going to risk it and see if I, if anybody out there says, oh, me too, or that, that thing of, I've always felt that way, but I've never thought of it like that. I've heard that a million times, but uh, that makes me reconsider it. Is that not an incredible reward, right? For taking the risk of just honestly approaching someone in a lyric or song in that way. So I think those are how those two things work together, uh, integrity and discipline toward a high work ethic. Uh, you can, I'll, I'll, I'll give you one more quote, okay? And then I'll- I love it, the keep thing. it going. I love this. Uh, I worked with an artist that only people from the 90s who knew CCM would know this name, but a, a great singer songwriter named Margaret Becker. Uh, told me one time that when she was indie, she felt like she was digging trenches in the dirt with her bare hands to put her songs into to get to people. When she signed her record deal, they gave her a shovel. <laughs> I love that because the image is you have a better tool now, but you still have to do the work. It's your job to do the digging. And every label, I don't care what they tell you when they're selling you to get you to come sign with them. It's true for every level. They cannot do that personal work for you that you have to do. And it's one of the first things we look for when we're scouting an artist is what is their work ethic like? And do they approach their work in a, in a way that reflects who they genuinely are, who they are as an honest person for that season of their life? And of course, that's going to change, right? Uh, you won't make the same music next year that you did this year because God is completing the work that he started in you always. That happens until you're gone. So uh, the work that you make now that reflects your own integrity and, and personal commitment to honesty will look different two years from now than it does now. That's awesome. Uh, you want your work to grow and change and morph according to what God's teaching you and doing. I always try to work with our artists and say, we're not making a movie here. We're just making a photograph, right? This is just a, a little slice of the season you're in right now. It may be 15 songs, I don't know, or it may be one, but you're not having to tell the story of your life. You're having to tell the story of what life you're living right now. If you just tell the truth about that, we'll be in good shape. <laughs> mm. That's awesome. Uh yeah, it sounds like authenticity. You know what? Exact. No, I, I loved I loved every bit of that because it really made me think of the importance of authenticity mm. in our art, um, and that each of us are uniquely called. Um, I think something I've learned as a songwriter is the importance of discovering and leaning into the unique voice that God has given me as an artist, and that. Uh, the world needs to hear that. So I know you work with a lot of artists um, and I think a lot of us tend to maybe sometimes want to fit the mold because we think that's what's going to be popular or yeah. um, accepted. But how about authenticity? Where does that fit in? <laughs> well, uh, contrary to popular opinion, I believe both those things can coexist in a song. And as evidence for that argument, I would present to you one Jason Gray. <laughs> Jason is our veteran artist on Centricity. Uh, I think we signed him in 08. And it has just been a marvel to learn from that guy as I watch him live out his commitment to taking deeper ideas, uh, uh, risky questions, thought-provoking notions that are not easily turned into hooky, memorable songs, and his commitment to do that. So go on, I, rather than me answer this question, and there are other ones like this, other artists certainly like this, but Jason is just the one I'm closest to and the most familiar with his work. Now, not every song is that, you know, there, there are some songs that need to just be an honest, here's I'm, I'm going to puke this out because I need to say this right now. And no one ever may listen to this or care about it. 
and there's there's a space for those songs. But if you if you look at his body of work, you'll see it all, including songs that uh, that someone else I think would have settled for. Uh, and that's when I say someone else, I'm not thinking of any particular artist, but just the temptation to take a, like he's got a song called Death Without a Funeral about his divorce. Well, Death Without a Funeral, that's a, that's a weighty idea, right? Or uh, his current project, he's got uh, Order, Disorder, Reorder, which was a, an idea that he read and you know, he, we're, we're sort of brainstorming together on like, like, is that a song or is it three EPs, which it ended up being, uh, but it also ended up being a song. And I remember saying to him, well, good luck making a hook out of that. <laughs> and he did it. So I, I think it's a, a really poppy, hooky song called Order, Disorder, Reorder. Oh, cool. Uh, Can we take through that? The idea and the theme of how God transforms us through order then disorder and then reorder that's some pretty deep water so um i i I would say to anyone it's it's not a mutually exclusive thing but give yourself permission to write songs that are not commercial and not uh popular sounding as you put it and that's good uh because you're not being judged by the last five songs you wrote, you know, uh, well, hopefully you're never being judged, but that your content uh, maybe, but it will be when you're done with this and you're in heaven, the body of your work is what will be left behind. And that's going to be all kinds of things. Right. And listen, one of the things we work the hardest on is pushing people toward writing commercial music that radio will play. So I'm, you're never going to hear from me that there's any shame in trying to write what sounds popular right now. Now, you never need to worry about that if you're not trying to make a living at what you do. But once you pick up that stick, you're going to find some really difficult wrestling with, I need to write what's honest and true for me, but I need to put it in a form that is simple and easy to sing and hooky for people to remember. It's difficult. I'm not saying it's easy, but I am saying that you can do both, especially if you look at the big picture and take the long view of your work, which is you're going to leave behind hundreds of songs, hopefully, right? Some of those songs no one will ever heard. Some of those songs will have meant a great deal to someone who went through something that is, is what the song is talking about. And some of those songs might be on the radio, that's fantastic. What a great breadth of work to leave behind. Uh, and there's a, you know, there's a, an idea that your job is to do the best work you can do and to tell the truth. That's your job. It's kind of God's job to figure out where that's going to go and who's going to hear it, right? I mean, you might have a team around you to, to help support you and promote you, but we can't make those kinds of things happen. You know, we can make it available to people. But that seed that's going in the ground, you can cultivate it and you can water it and take care of it and be precious about it, but you cannot make fruit come up. You mm. just, you've got to be a faithful scatterer, a faithful planter, right? And I, I think God honors that sort of attitude about creative work. I love that, a faithful scatterer. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've heard it put that way. And, you know, I, I've been learning and not, I'm not an old dog in this, um, in this field by any means. I've just, just recently, probably in the past five years started scattering songs, um, as you put it, but Fantastic. I think this digital age is kind of, um, is tricky and you've been in the industry long enough to know, you know, and, and have seen the, the morphing and changing of the industry. And it seems like there's a lot of music out there everybody yeah. can everybody that can sit at home and record something they're they're scattering it a lot <laughs> so what yes. what, would, what would a suggestion be for those that truly feel called to um share their their songs that god is giving yeah. to them and what are effective ways that you're seeing that people can do that well probably uh a philosophical answer to that is that you can't not do it because there's so much of it being done, right? Uh, if you 
if you have some sense of calling and who knows how to define that uh, you, you know if you go old testament with calling it probably means a totally different thing than the way we use the the word today but uh maybe a resonance or a, a pull toward creating right and expressing yourself uh that won't go away maybe there's some calling in that right but if you do if you feel that way about your work or at least the work that you want to make uh then that's all that matters you can't look at i think it's now up to almost 60,000 songs a day that are uploaded to spotify that's just gross right and and if you look at that it will it will crush the heart that you have for wanting to create so you just get super practical you get over that hump first which is i'm going to do this regardless i have to do this so you get over that hump first then once you're over that you make the best work you can and there's all kinds of i mean there's you know there's uh, distro kid and orchard and cd baby all these distribution outlets that work with independent artists and songwriters and they you take a little percentage and they upload all your music to all these platforms spotify apple music amazon all those uh so you're represented there and uh you know you can i think most labels have this we have an info at centricity music that we get links sent to us all the time and and uh we don't the A and R team doesn't personally listen to every one of those, but we do like have interns and people who help us to to listen and respond to every one of those. So uh, I can't say that every label does that, but that's a value that we hold at Centricity that if someone is they're fighting the good fight and they worked up enough courage to send something in, we want to at least honor that courage and the dignity of being a human creator and acknowledge that we listen to it and maybe try to say something encouraging, you know, and we, have, we have found a couple of things over the years through somebody just sending their stuff in. So, uh, y anything that you think, well, no one will ever hear that. This is dumb. It's just going out into the ether out in the internet space out there. You just don't know. I'll say this, uh, and, and this is talking super practically, um, a&R, the work that we do, has changed a whole lot in the last four or five years as the digital age has descended upon it. And the way it's, you know, everything we used to do was, are you interested in the person and who they are? And then are, are you interested in the music they make? Do you feel like you could be successful with this, you know? Well, now the horse and the cart have sort of changed places where everything is about social media numbers. Now, we're not this, we're not even equipped to do this, but major label A and R teams have three and four people on their teams that all they do is look at social media numbers. And they have they have platforms to aggregate all these numbers, you know, and they can slice them and dice the data any way they want to. But I have heard hilarious stories of somebody bringing a song or an artist into an A and R meeting and being excited about the song. They play it for the team. And these research, they're, they're called A&R research data people. They're over here on their laptops going, nah, move on. There's nothing there. Numbers are no good. <laughs> that's a little bit gross, but that's where the industry is headed. And it is, maybe it is a little bit gross because it feels very non-music, right? But uh, most of the, most of these A&R, the people who head up these teams would say, no, we just want, we want to balance the gut reaction and our instinct with what the numbers are telling us. Look, people are reacting to this song, this music, this track. And we, if they are, then that's a good head start for us, right? Because that's what you do when you sign something. You try to get people interested in it. And here, these numbers show us there's already a lot of interest or some interest. Sometimes you're not even looking at the numbers as much as you are the trends, right? Look, it's grown 20% in two weeks, something's happening with, with this artist or this track. So all that to say, to spend some time and work and energy and even in money in some cases, even though most of it's free, uh, to establish your social media profiles, get some music out there on Spotify, Apple, SoundCloud, uh, even TikTok 
it's incredible what's happening at TikTok right now. Eight artists were signed to major label deals off of TikTok last year. Oh my in goodness. In the pandemic, eight artists got major label deals because they started on TikTok. So I that, had no idea. I was missing yeah. out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so to have your music at least out there so mm -hmm. that uh, somebody can look at what's happening with it. And again, you may have only gone from 20 Instagram followers to 100 in a month, but that's a pretty good slope. Like when you're looking at that on a graph, that's going to pop up and you're going to go, something's, why is that growing so fast? You're going to investigate a little more. So I would say to those people, yes, there's a gross amount of music being uploaded every day. You got to forget about that and upload your music and just I, we'll go back to the previous question. Let, let's see what God will do with that. Yeah. You know, uh, the, the most recent, the girl, uh, a girl from Phoenix right now that I'm signing, uh, I found her on Instagram. It's the first one I've done. Now I wasn't, I wasn't surfing Instagram to find her, but she covered a Jordan Flea song. Who's one of our artists. She tagged Jordan and I followed him and there she was singing his song, the river. And that's where it started. So just that you are present on these platforms and doing the best you can to keep that. Now, I will say, Andrea, something that does not look good is for you to have an Instagram account with three posts on it and the last one being from 2018, right? That does not say a good thing about your engagement with people. So, right. But it is a, it's a thing that you need to take seriously as a growing writer and artist these days. And it is the method for reaching people. Mm. Yes, it's crowded, but you never know what God's going to do with anything that you put out there. Amen. Yeah. Okay. So almost shifting gears a little bit, uh, because you know, there are a lot of people out there that love to share their work and want to share their work, are not afraid to share their work. But I, I do work personally with some people that uh, are very hesitant, are mm -hmm. maybe a little embarrassed to share their work, um, even though they are, they are creating beautiful things that speak to the, the creative giftedness um, extended from God himself. And there, it just, what would you say to someone who really hesitates to share, um, is a little shy about it, maybe? Yeah. I might start with quoting Steve Jobs, who uh, looked at his engineers and designers as artists. And, uh, you know, if you look, if you take the back off of an iPhone, it's beautiful in there. <laughs> I mean, the, these are, it's incredible what these people, you know, design and build. But he had a slogan. He said, true artists ship, S-H-I-P, true artists ship. In other words, if it doesn't go out to someone so they can use it in some way or experience it in some way, it's not art. It's just something you did for yourself. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it might be a piece of music or something, but it's not art. Because art is something that is a currency between people. It goes out to someone. And I, Andrea, I think I may have mentioned this to you in another conversation we had, but uh, this came home to me in, uh, in, in 2013 when my mom was in her last stages of, of living in this world and she was in a nursing home. And uh, 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 this was one day before she passed away and a, uh, you know, she was pretty much out of it already, but the sweetest lady, probably late forties, early fifties tapped on our door and uh, uh, she had a mandolin with her and uh, would your mom like to hear some music, you know? And uh, y you, you know, you're experiencing a lot of emotion at that time already, of course. And I said, of course, you know, of course, come in. And she said, well, uh, do you know any hymns that she likes or favorite hymns? And I told her a couple and she did sing a couple of those. And then she said, um, I've written a couple of songs that that might be a blessing to her. <laughs> and Andrea, these were not songs that I would have ever gone. Oh, that's a great song. But mm -hmm. so right for the moment. And the heart from which they were offered. Mm -hmm. 
And I wish so badly that I had gotten this lady's name because I would love to take her around with me and just go, see, she was showing her work in a, the most, the gigantic kingdom way by, by sitting in that dingy little nursing home hospital room and, and offering what she had to my mom. And in some ways, kind of saying my mom into heaven, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it was the, the most precious gift to her and to me. So it helped me realize that, uh, you know, if, if someone is struggling to show their work, first of all, there's so many ways to do it. So many places you know, like that lady just showing up at a nursing home saying, can I, do you mind if I go in and sing to some of the patients? Do you realize what a little voice and ukulele sounds like to a person who hasn't heard music in a while, you know, mm. and it was just so beautiful in there. But uh, like, there's, there's so many ways to do it, but maybe you change your thinking from, uh, you know, if a person could sort of pinch their middle, their, their, their finger and their thumb together in just a little gap like that, that would represent the Christian music industry, the worship music industry. But if you reach your arms out as far as you can, that's the kingdom. There's so many ways to use your music in the kingdom. If it's in a nursing home, if it's to teach third graders, if it's, uh, I know a guy who plays, he's an ex-fireman. He goes around and plays songs for fire departments because they're always hanging out, you know, waiting <laughs> to be called. And he'll just go take his guitar and play songs for them. That's, that's where he's contributing, right? That's where he's shipping. If true artists ship, that's where he's doing it. Uh, there's another great book uh, I read years ago. I think it was written in the 30s called uh, If You Want to Write by a lady named Brenda Euland, who was a language teacher in the, in the 30s. And uh, she said she was taking piano lessons from a piano teacher when she was a kid. And her, she finished a piece and her piano teacher said, it's good. Who's it for? <laughs> and like her working that out in the book of like, this teacher was trying to encourage her, like, this is all about you. And that's not what art is for. It's not for you. It's for you to create, but it's for others to experience. And if you don't give God an opportunity to do something with it, it, there's something just sort of narcissistic about it, isn't it? Like how many hundreds of songs do you have then that no one's ever heard? Go do something with them. There's plenty of, uh, use your imagination a little bit. There's plenty of outlets, uh, but they might not necessarily fit your Christian music industry thinking about what needs to happen with those songs. You got to get out of that and start to think more kingdom mm. and your mind may explode with all the places you could use your songs. I love that. Think, think kingdom instead of, Industry. yeah, we can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of being a Christian artist is um, I was just talking to a gentleman today uh, earlier this morning that um, he put it in a perspective for me. Like he's a writer. And when he writes, he said, okay, primarily I'm writing for God. That's my, that's my first and foremost. And then I am writing to serve the, um, the work itself, like the words, you know, making sure that what I'm writing is well-crafted and well-delivered. And, and then I'm serving, you know, also the audience that would hear it. Yeah. And then after that, he said, I am also serving those that would take this work and, um, help me deliver it. Like, so if you have a band or if in his case, it was, he's in a theater group. So it was those that per are performing this work with him. And it was, it was interesting in our conversation, how he didn't even show up in that list until way, way down. You know, he was definitely um, much more kingdom focused in art, just mm -hmm. even focused on the art itself, uh, the beauty yeah. of the art itself. It was really a, a good reminder. So I love that. Awesome. Love that. Yeah. So last question, and then we'll try to kind of wrap up here, but I, um, I, I work with quite a few people that tend to say, I just don't, I don't even know what to write anymore, <laughs> or I don't know what to paint, or I don't know, I don't even know what to create. So 
what would you say to someone who feels like they've lost their artistic voice? Wow. Um, hearing you say that, you know, that's a little sobering to say it that way. Um, but I, I think this may, this may like bundle it up too nicely, but it, it just feels like writer's block, which is something that every creative person has struggled with for generations. And now there's been so much writing on it and people talking about it. Like it's hilarious. You can YouTube writer's block and hundreds of videos will come up about people's theories of how to get through it. And, and uh, even exercises that like you go through, but uh, I, probably every creative person gets hung up at different places, you know, uh, in, in the process. There's a really good book uh, by a guy named Eric Mizell called Fearless Creating. And it's not about songwriting. It's just about creating anything, but it's certainly applicable to songwriting. And in this book, he goes through what he believes are the six stages of creativity. Uh, and they are... Uh, wishing, choosing, which to me, that's like wishing is just sort of that hand in your back, you know, like I want to create something. And uh, choosing is sort of the expression that that wishing will take. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing the art form, right, that this wishing will take. Uh, choosing, wishing, starting, working, completing, and you would think, wait, completing. So there's only five. You're done. No, the last one is showing, which we've already talked about. It, but even Eric Mazel would say, no, you haven't created anything until you show it. I love that. But uh, those like that starting, working, completing, there's probably something in there for a lot of people that is, uh, I get hung up in one of these three places. Uh, like I, I, I want to start a song today, but uh, the kids are yelling. It's, it, I, I can't focus. Uh, so they need to work in that area. Like they need a space where they know it's going to be quiet. And you, maybe you tell the kids, unless you've lost a limb, don't come in here for the next hour, right? Uh, like people in your house understand this is holy for me. This is sacred. This hour I'm about to spend. It I actually may. have a sign for my door that says recording in progress. And my family knows if that sign is on there, leave mama alone. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Uh, the working piece, like this, this plagues me all the time. Uh, like, uh, like finding uh, oh, the right format, the right software, the right, oh, oh, this is new. I want to try that. But I didn't, I didn't even finish with the old one that I had or just you dabble around for, you know, this is more starting and working, but you sit down at your space and you realize you dabbled around on something and now it's, you're two hours in and you, you got to go. You just, you never actually went to work, right? But you, that thing, and most creatives have experienced this where you, you look for the flow, like you started at two o'clock and you look up and it's 430. Like you, you can't believe it. You, th you thought you'd been there 10 minutes. Uh, that sort of commitment to that sort of flow. It doesn't always happen, but uh, y your phone rings. There, I mean, there's so many distractions to keep you from working, right? And then completing. Completing is so fascinating because I think, in my own experience, saying something is finished is the, you have to come to terms with your own level of gifting, right? To say, all right, it's done. Because you can always keep working on it. And there is some place that you embrace the idea that it's never going to be exactly like you want it to be. That's very rare for anybody. But to say, you know what, this is the best work I can do today. I'm going to call this one finished and I'm going to start something else. There is, I wish I could remember this guy. And if people wanted to Google him, they could find him. But there is a, a Renaissance era painter uh, who was considered at the time one of the greats. He was, I think, a portrait, a portrait painter. He is known today, and his work tours museums and uh, galleries. He's known because he could not finish a painting. So there are like five canvases that tour around the country, and you can look and go, that's brilliant. That beginning is brilliant, but he couldn't finish. 
he could not come to terms with his own level of gifting, right? And so he'd rather just not finish it than, than do that. So what a legacy now for this guy to live with, that he's the guy who couldn't finish. And Andrea, I know guys with hundreds of unfinished songs in their computers or in their notebooks or voice memos, hundreds. That tells me something, right? That there's, a, there's someone's getting hung up right here and it's time to come to terms with it. There's all, there's all that. There's, I've heard someone say once that uh, if you are blocked and you really look inward about it, there's probably something that you feel like you're needing to say and you're just afraid to say it. And uh, that, I don't know that that resolves anything, but it might be a key to the door, right? Mm -hmm. What is it that I'm afraid to say? That question might be the key to the door to unlocking some things. But uh, other than that, which are more practical things, I think we already talked about this, but this notion of uh, yeah, I'm a mom, I'm raising kids, or I've got a full-time job or whatever, but I've got three hours a week. And you know what I'm going to do with those? I'm going to write. Uh, everything in me says you're writing the same stuff over and over again. You're no good. You suck. Everybody's work is better than yours. That's just the voice that you're going to have to resist uh, because everybody deals with it. And you, according to your own theology, you can decide where that voice is coming from, right? Some people would say the enemy. There's an awesome book on this called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield, who uh, calls it the resistance. But every creative deals with the resistance. And that resistance is usually what I call the you suck voice. Uh, you just, it, it wins the battle for the song, not the war, but it wins the battle for that day's work because you just, you, you believed the voice rather than your own uh, ability to do the work. Uh, and I don't know of any other way to overcome the voice other than just keep doing it. There's an incredible Vincent Van Gogh. If, if no one has read uh, Letters to Theo, that are a collection of letters that Vincent Van Gogh wrote to his brother, Theodore, mostly during the time he was institutionalized, uh, but in, in one of those letters, he wrote to Theodore, if the voice inside you says you can't paint, then by all means paint, and the mm. voice will be silenced. <laughs> I'm going to say it again. If the voice inside you says you can't paint, then by all means paint, and the voice will be silenced. I believe that is so true, Andrea, but I also don't believe it would be silenced in the next 15 minutes. It might not be silenced for three months, I don't know. But that's not yours to worry about in a way. Your job is to show up. I wanna recommend, let me see if I can find this real quick. There's an awesome video. Uh, Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Love, she did a TED talk called Your Elusive Creative Genius. Your Elusive Creative Genius. It might be good for your readers to, to see. It's on YouTube. Cool. And uh, it's a fantastic, very motivating talk, not from a Christian perspective necessarily, but uh, uh, that, that deals with this. Your job is to show up. And if the voice wins the battle for your work, that's, you won't just be blocked. You just won't even be trying anymore. Uh, and I think that's where things get separated is the people who have the intestinal fortitude the encouragement from people there that love them, whatever it is to go, no, go right. You've got an hour, go right. Don't waste this hour. And you make it up from that hour going, that was the biggest waste of time. There's nothing there. Then go right again tomorrow and do it the next day and do it the next day. And the voice will be silenced. That's awesome. No, and we'll look up that video and try to share uh, yeah, that in our show notes, along with you've, you've dropped a lot of book ideas on us. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, kind of resources are really helpful. Awesome. Well, John, yeah. thank you so some much for your time. Old. Oh, some of those are old. Yeah, you know, some of them we may have to dig a little harder, maybe eBay or something, but we'll <laughs> yeah. see if, if we can find it. Write, that Brenda Yulin book was, was written in the 30s. Oh, that's so fantastic. I, know, found it. Fine. I, I would make one other recommendation, though, that's super like. 
if songwriting is two halves, and I think you could make an argument that it is, it's one half is, is gifting, right? Like you just, you were born with this love for putting words and melodies together and you can't get over it. Uh, that's gift. And thank God for it because you can't teach yourself the gift. Like you just either have it or you don't. But what you do with the gift, I would call crafting, like learning what to do with that lyric and melody and how to make it better and better, how to apply poetic devices to it and rhyme and metaphor and simile and contrast and all these things that you learn, alliteration, all these things that you learn can make your work better, that you can learn and grow in and make your gift even more applicable and universal, right? Well, there's a, there's a book that country songwriters keep in their backpack, and this thing was written in the 70s, but, it, but it's called The Craft of Lyric Writing. And our, our good friend John Chisholm would, uh, would know uh, about this book, and I know he's recommended it. Uh, it it br just breaks down pop songs. And um, the problem with the book is these are pop songs from the 70s, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, like younger readers like yourself would, would might not be familiar with these songs, but it's still applicable. Uh, what, like she analyzes what these, why these lyrics work and, and then, uh, you know, d divides the different categories of lyric crafting and, and tools that you have at your expense. And there are guys who keep this book in their backpack and, and pull it out every day. So it might not, speak to you, but it, it is a super practical book that a lot of people you still use. That's really helpful. No, it sounds like a she has a workbook too. Oh uh, lyric writing workbook. Sheila Davis. Sheila Davis. All right. Well I will look that one up too. It sounds like a great resource. Yeah. Awesome. Well, John, how can our listeners connect with you? I know you mentioned you've got like some email addresses with centricity there. Is that kind of the yeah. best way? Info at centricitymusic.com. Uh, there's someone who, as all those emails come in, they parse them out to wherever they need to go. So if you sent someone something there with my name in it, it would get to me. Fantastic. Yeah. Awesome. And is there anything new coming up from Centricity Music that we can look oh, for? Oh, always. 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 Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right now, I'm working on a, uh, a couple of new things. Uh, one is a 19-year-old a singer-songwriter named Kobe James, who we've released a good bit of music on, but we haven't tried to go to radio yet. We're still trying to find that, and this is a lot of my work, you're trying to find that place where the music that he loves and wants to make intersects what radio will play, right? And trying to find that overlap. Uh, but uh other than that, uh, Kobe's fun to listen to. Uh, I'm working on a new unspoken record, uh, just starting Lauren right now. Uh, something that your listeners might enjoy listening to is, uh, and this Matt, another a &R person, is working with him, but uh, a guy named Chris Renzema. Chris is a little bit of an anomaly for us because we wanted, for, for a couple of years, we had a mission, our goal, I should say, to try to find and identify and sign an artist that we weren't so dependent on radio to, to expose, get exposed. And uh, by God's grace, we found Chris and Chris already had a lot going on as an indie artist, but until COVID happened, uh, things have calmed down a little bit. But before that, like his, his touring and mostly among college students was just blowing up. In, in ways that you don't usually see when somebody doesn't have a hit, right? Uh, he's never even been on radio, and we love that. <laughs> so he's at least maybe a good case study, and you might call what he does worship music, but not all of it. But uh, to realize that there is a home out there, there's a way to reach people, even when everybody's saying, well, we got to have radio not the case with everybody and Chris is a good example of that he's working on some new music right now and uh, if if people are Lauren fans out there uh, she wrote a song when she was touring in 2019 called hold on to me that uh, she loved the song when she wrote it and she actually just started working it into her set on that tour 
and it got recorded live. And then we kind of did a studio version of that live recording. And that's going to release this Friday uh, as a new single from Lauren. It's not a new song, but to the public, it will be a new song. Uh, and uh, that, that little tip of the hat to new Lauren music. Fantastic. And we're recording this on February 25th. So, oh, yeah. uh, and that's, so tomorrow, it releases tomorrow. That's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. fantastic. So, I look forward to that. And we will be sure to link some of this new, um, yeah, I remember you mentioning Chris uh, back in October and uh, I yeah. have since kind of checked him out and very exciting, very neat, um, neat style. I really do enjoy yeah. his work yeah. very much. Well, great. Well, John, thank you again so much. And I, I always love to end every conversation I have uh, by praying for you, my mm -hmm. guest, and um, thanking God for the work you're doing. So yeah, mm -hmm. let's, let's finish that way. Well, Father God, we thank you so much for this time to connect. Um, thank you for John and the work that he has faithfully done over the years and is still doing. Lord, thank you for calling him into the music industry. Um, he's been a huge blessing to so many uh, as a champion for artists. And that's such a gift, um, such a gift to those who he interacts with and those that benefit from the art being produced. Uh, Lord, um, just thank you for gifting him uh, as a champion and Lord, for Centricity Music, we pray that the work before them, Lord, you just bless their efforts, bless their desire to um, pour into the kingdom your messages of hope, love, and your character, Lord. And we just, we thank you for the, the work that they're doing. Um, go before them and thank you so much for John's encouragement today. Uh, his wisdom and his uh, suggestions for those that truly do seek to honor you uh, with their art. Lord, and thank you for his encouragement to those that um, need to be spurred on in that as well, Lord. Um, thank you again for this conversation this time uh, with John today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, John. Well, so good to chat with you today. And yeah, we'll have to, we may even split this conversation into two oh, parts because it was so good. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I've kept yeah, you so long. <laughs> just get the razor blade out and they'll be uh, ready to cut away. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to connecting again soon. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. Creatively Christian is a product of Theophany Media. You can find out more at theophanymedia.com. This show is hosted by Brandon Hollingsworth, Andrea Sandifer, Bill Brooks, and Lynn Baber. Our logo is by Bill Brooks. Our music is by Bill Brooks and Andrea Sandifer. And remember, if you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to rate, review, and share wherever you listen to podcasts. Have a blessed day and keep on creating for our Lord.